And it's also interesting to see how the coup has been portrayed in different countries, for example, Russia and Iran coming out in support of Erdogan, whereas the US and NATO uh, have been clearly unhappy with the result. You're listening to The Corbett Report. Welcome, friends. James Corbett here from CorbettReport.com in a conversation that is being recorded on the 26th of July, 2016. Today, we're joined once again by Christoph German of the New Great Game blog at ChristophGerman.blogspot.com. The link to that blog will be in the show notes for this interview, as always. Christoph, thank you again for coming on the program. Thanks for having me, James. Let's talk about what is one of the main, one of the many, I I guess, things on the geopolitical table this month, Uh, the failed Turkish coup that took place on July 15th of, uh, well, this year. Um, Obviously, some incredible events that were taking place there, and obviously still a lot that's happening in the aftermath of that, and fingers being pointed in a lot of directions. One of the fingers, of course, being pointed in squarely in the direction of Fethullah Gulen, who I hope will be familiar to my audience. If not, please see my recent work on who is Fethullah Gulen. But let's uh, let's try to collect some of the evidence here. What do we know about Gulen's potential involvement in this coup? So first of all, I would like to stress that I'm not an expert on Fethullah Gulen or the Gulen movement, as listeners of my last podcast with Piers Redmond probably noticed, because during this podcast, I actually made a major mistake when I suggested that Fethullah Gülen himself isn't that important anymore and serves um, primarily as figurehead and spiritual leader of his movement. I was assuming that he's no longer running his network and taking all important decisions because he looks really old and senile. But, But as one of our listeners pointed out to us, that's not the case and Gülen is still very much in control of things. And recent reports actually confirm this. It's very important to point out that the Gülen movement has a strict hierarchical um, structure. Gülen is at the top of the pyramid and individual world regions like Central Asia or Europe are each managed by a local leader. And this hierarchy extends all the way down to national and local brothers and city neighborhoods. So if the Gülen movement decides to launch a coup in Turkey, This decision is not made on a local level, but directly by Gülen or rather his uh, CIA handlers. And one of the most important pieces of information that has come out about the coup in recent days is the testimony of Turkish chief of staff Hulusi Akka, who was taken hostage by the coup plotters. They pressured Akka to sign an order commanding all units to join the coup and to go on TV and tell the nation that the army with its entire chain of command had been taken over. And according to Akka's recent testimony, they also offered to put him in touch with their opinion leader, Fethullah Gülen. But Akka refused to cooperate with them and stayed loyal to Erdogan, which was one of the key developments that decided the fate of the coup. If Akka's testimony is not forged and he is telling the truth, that's enough to directly implicate Fethullah Gülen in the coup attempt. And the United States will have to explain why they can't extradite him despite mounting evidence of his involvement. And they are all had already having major problems explaining what Fethullah Gülen is, already, is even doing in the United States. Just last week, um, we saw State Department spokesman Mark Toner uh, show one of his best comedic performances when he was asked about Gülen during the daily press briefing. And Gülen's old CIA friend Graham Fuller was forced to write an article in the Huffington Post defending Gülen and his cult-like movement. Fuller went even on the record admitting that he vouched for Gülen when the FBI came for him and he was facing deportation. But thinking that Gülen might have something to do with the CIA is, of course, crazy conspiracy talk, according to Graham Fuller. What Fuller didn't mention in this Huffington Post article is that he himself was targeted by the FBI in a counterintelligence investigation known as Gladio B. And what Fuller also didn't mention is that he was not the only one coming to Gülen's help. Former U.S. ambassador to Turkey and CIA operative Morten Abramowitz 
also wrote a letter on Gülen's behalf when he applied for permanent residency in the United States. And I've also seen some reports saying George, uh, George Fidas also intervened on Gülen's behalf. So we have not one, but at least two, possibly three people linked to the CIA helping Gülen to get a green card, which is a remarkable coincidence. And in another remarkable coincidence, Abramovitz teamed up with another US, former U.S. ambassador to Turkey, Eric Edelman, to write not just one, but two op-eds in the Washington Post calling for Erdogan's overthrow. One interesting side note, Eric Edelman was also a target of the FBI's Gladio B investigation, just like Graham Fuller. And the first of these Abramowitz Edelman op-eds in the Washington Post calling for Erdogan's overthrow was published in January 2014. That's significant because the big fallout between Erdogan and Gülen happened just one month earlier, in December 2013, when the Gülen movement targeted Erdogan and the AKP in a huge corruption scandal. Erdogan's corruption was well known and had never been a problem, but when he and his associates used a gas for gold scheme to circumvent US sanctions against Iran, that upset quite a few people. And as Gülen's former second-in-command pointed out in a recent interview, the Gülen movement has not only close ties with the CIA, but also with Mossad. And Gülen is a big supporter of Israel, and he takes a hard line on Russia and Iran. For years, there had been a simmering conflict between Gülen and the AKP over issues uh, such as the Mavi Marmara incident or peace talks with the Kurds. But uh, this simmering conflict escalated into all-out war in December uh, 2013. And ever since, the Gülen movement has been trying to topple Erdogan with the blessing of people like Morten Abramowitz and Eric Edelman, who are not just former U.S. government officials, but also representatives of the deep state. And much to their dismay, Erdogan survived the exposure of Turkish arms transfers to Syrian rebels, as well as all kinds of damning leaks. And he responded with a crackdown on the Gülen movement. After Erdogan shut down Gülen's mouthpiece, Zaman, in March of this year, Abramowitz and Edelman wrote another op-ed titled Erdogan must reform or resign. And by late March, a speculation about a military coup in Turkey had reached a point where the US State Department spokesman was asked during the daily press briefing if the United States was trying to overthrow the government in Turkey. And two days later, while Erdogan was in Washington, the Turkish military even released an unusual statement dismissing speculation about the coup as baseless. So this coup attempt didn't come out of nowhere. There had been rumors floating around that something was about to happen in July, and this makes perfect sense, given that Turkey's uh, Supreme Military Council meeting was scheduled for early August, and the Supreme Military Council decides on promotions and appointments of generals and admirals in the Turkish armed forces. The Gülenists within the armed forces feared that the council was planning to discharge most of them, because the Erdogan government wanted to see mass purges. Um, one of the most important missions of newly appointed Chief of Staff Hulusi Akar was to combat the Gülenists in the armed forces, and there were several lists circulating with names of um, such officers. So the window of opportunity for a Gülenist coup was closing in July. And the Erdogan government was of course waiting for something to happen. That's, that's why they were more or less prepared and noticed the coup uh, attempt as well that was originally planned for 3 a.m. later that night, already on Friday afternoon, forcing the coup plotters to launch the operation immediately. Um, but as Piers and I pointed out in our last podcast, the coup might have succeeded if a few things had gone better for the coup plotters. Uh, so I think the threat was real for Erdogan. I think that's the uh, that's the takeaway that I have of this. It's probably the most likely scenario that this was a coup attempt, that there had been rumors swir swirling around, it was flushed out early, and as a result, it didn't quite go the way that plotters had planned that certainly falls into place at least at least it makes sense but again there's so much floating around that we can't know for sure one thing that i imagine the gulenists would say in response to akar's testimony is that 
that testimony itself is unreliable, that he has been forced to say this or that he's saying it to defend Erdogan, to, to try to put point the finger at Gulen. What's your take on Akar's situation here? Do you, do you put faith in the testimony that he's giving? He is clearly beholden to Erdogan at this point. He has showed his loyalty, but I don't think the government would choose to put uh, such um, words in his mouth. And we have seen other testimonies that has, have come out, also by um, um, supposed um, coup plotters, but these testimonies um, are useless because they were um, given under torture. Uh, many of the coup plotters who have been detained are, of course, now being tortured. That's, that's been happening in Turkey for decades, and the Erdogan government is not going to change this. So that's a problem we have with many of these testimonies. But um, the testimonies are, of course, not the only thing pointing uh, to U.S. and NATO involvement in this. There are fingerprints all over this. Um, for example, as many as four um, KC-135 uh, tanker aircraft starting from Inchelik Air Base to a refuel aircraft that were used in the coup attempt. Um, at least three out of five regiments that participated in the coup in Istanbul were part of NATO's rapid uh, deployable course. And of course, yes, just yesterday, the Turkish embassy in Washington confirmed that the NBC report about Erdogan seeking asylum in Germany was completely baseless, which indirectly confirms that this was a PSYOP launched by the US military at the head of the coup. And it's also interesting to see how the coup has been portrayed in different countries, for example, Russia and Iran coming out in support of Erdogan, whereas the US and NATO uh, have been clearly unhappy with the result. And in recent days, we have seen a number of interesting leaks come out in NATO countries. Last week, uh, Greek Air Force sources told Greek media that Erdogan's plane was neither accompanied by Turkish F-16s nor harassed by any other aircraft, as Turkish government and military sources have been claiming. And just the other day, German magazine Focus published a story saying that about 30 minutes after the coup started, GCHQ intercepted Turkish government communications saying that they are going to blame this on Gülen and that the purge starts tomorrow. And this information was apparently leaked to Focus, which is very interesting in itself. So we are now seeing leaks from NATO members suggesting that the president of a NATO ally staged a coup. And as far as I know, that's unprecedented. You would think that right there would be some sort of grounds for some sort of motion to start expelling that member from NATO, you would think, or at least doing something about this president, this problem president, if they really did have those goods. It's And why leak it to a German magazine? That I, Again, that doesn't make sense to me. It's very strange. This, I mean, there's a data dump of information in here, and I understand what you're saying, but I understand this will be very difficult for people who haven't been following this story to follow all these pieces. So, of course, we'll put the links to all of the things we're talking about in the show notes for this interview. But uh, that raises the question, what what sources do you use? Is there Are there any sources that you think are particularly valuable for people who want to get a gr- grasp of this story? Uh, I think Al Monitor had a few useful articles, especially by Metin Gurchan, about um, the developments of the coup that night, what really happened, and why the coup was um, was happening at that time in July um, because of the upcoming um, Supreme Military Council meeting. But other than that, I would just um, try to get as many sources as possible. As um, For example, you have to read what a Turkish pro-government media is saying, for example, Yeni Shafak. They have come out and accused, directly accused, a retired U.S. Army General John F. Campbell of being the mastermind behind the coup. And today they accused um, Henry Barkey, who was director of the Wilson Center, I think, a think tank, and former CIA, or still CIA, of being the second mastermind behind the coup. And they are directly accusing the United States of being behind this. And this of, of information, of course, has to be taken with a grain of salt. So uh, I would just such, uh, suggest to, to read as many sources as possible as you can just to, get a, um, to get a clear picture. Because in the West, we are seeing a lot of reports that are essentially PR or propaganda for the Green Movement. Yes, well, sage advice. To try to cast your net widely and uh, use some discernment when looking at the various information that's coming through. On that note, of course, we will direct people once again to your website, the new great game website at christophgerman.blogspot.com. 
Also, uh, of course, to your recent appearance with Pierce Redmond and your ongoing series, the uh, the great uh, the Porkins Great Game podcast, and also your Twitter feed, which is a valuable source of all of this information as it's coming through. I've been wa- looking at that quite closely in the last few days, and I appreciate all the information, including that comical State Department uh, press. Uh, press conference that you talked about where they're trying to explain why Gulen is in the US. It does have to be seen to be uh, understood for its comedic value. All right. um, Lots and lots of information here in this interview. Thank you for your time, Christoph. I appreciate it. And uh, take care and thank you for all the work that you're doing. Thanks, James.